James chapter number 1. We'll begin reading in verse number 12. And James writes, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say he is tempted. I am, t I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth, tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when the lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now, before we can really get into what these verses have to say, by way of introduction, we need to understand some things about you as an individual as the way that God created you. Okay, now, Jesus said the great commandment was to love the Lord with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Okay, those three things. So we know that you are made up of a heart, a soul, and a mind. Okay, we also know, as the Apostle Paul wrote, that the spirit lusts against the flesh, that you can't do both at the same time. So we also know that you have a spirit, and you also have flesh. Okay, so those five things we need to kind of break down for a minute. Well, let's start with heart, soul, and mind. Well, your heart, as we have taught on before, is the seat of emotion in your life. Okay, that is where your feeling comes from, from a biblical perspective. So when Christ said, love the Lord with all thy heart, what he's saying is with all your emotion, with all your passion, with everything that you desire, everything that you love, everything that you cherish, you should love the Lord supremely as that utmost desire, that thing that you love most. Okay, but then what is the mind? The mind is the seat of rationality. Okay, that's where you view things. That's where you start dissecting. You start doing some mental calculations on, well, if I do that, what's the most likely outcome? If I were to do this, what would I have to give up over here? Right, when you're sitting at a stoplight, well, is it easier to sit here? If I turn right here, can I get the light to go, you know? All, all that kind of stuff, that's mental thinking. Right, when you're jumping through hoops and doing so-called mental arithmetic, that is with your mind. Well, the great commandment, love the Lord with all thy mind. With everything that you do, consider first, when you're making those things, don't leave out God. Right? The fleshly man, the carnal man, when he looks at a situation, he says, well, here's A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Doesn't consider God. Okay, for instance, Moses, he gets to the edge of the Red Sea, Okay, he did the math. Well, God told us to go here. God's going to do something, but he didn't know what it was yet. Well, they said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He didn't leave the Lord out of his mental calculation. Okay, I mean, we can go back and we can look at all the things. Not only did he cause a great east wind to blow so hard that it parted the Red Sea and then dried the ground on the bottom of the sea so that they could walk across on dry ground, you know, that message of Brother Jeffrey Phillips, God's got my back. That pillar of fire kept the armies of Pharaoh from reaching them. Right? Great things done there, but the carnal man can't see those when the mind is thinking. Right? But if you think, keeping in mind the Lord, and that one, he's God, he's all-powerful, he's omnipresent, and he's all-knowing, when you see something that says, you know what, I don't think that make, makes much sense, when it comes to the carnal man, but in my mind, if I keep the Lord in my mind, that's why David said, early will I seek thee. If you keep your mind stayed upon the things of the Lord, when you see that, you're thinking, eh, carnal man doesn't see a way out. But see, I can't calculate God. I can't reduce God down to logic. I mean, the Bible talks about the spirit, like the wind. You don't know when it's going to blow. You don't know how it's going to blow. You don't know what direction it's going to blow from, how long it's going to blow, or when it's going to stop. But I do know when it's blowing. So if our mind, when we face something that we think is insurmountable, if we love the Lord with all our mind, we say, I can't figure it out, but I believe that God's got to figure it out. It is your mind that exercises faith probably the most because your mind is all the time saying no that doesn't make sense but faith says even though it doesn't make sense I'm going to believe God anyway okay so what's the soul well the soul for lack of a better term 
is the thing that makes the decisions. Think about it. You have emotion. You may feel a certain way. You have your mind. You may be thinking that this is the best outcome. But you can do all the thinking and you can do all the feeling you want to. Neither of those two things makes the decision for you. That is your soul. It is our soul that is saved because the soul is the thing that we used to believe in Christ. We made the decision to accept Christ as our Savior. That's why our soul is sealed after we believe upon Christ. Because the soul is the thing that chooses to do. Before that, we chose to do sin. And afterwards, after we believed on Him, our soul can no longer sin, but it still can make the decision to do it. So it's saying, love the Lord with all your emotion. Love the Lord with all your thinking and everything. Remember that it may not make sense to me, but it makes sense to God if He told me to do it. And so, love the Lord thy God with all your decisions. Do as unto the Lord. The Bible does teach that. That if God gave you a job, you're supposed to do unto your boss as you would do as if Christ was the one that asked you to do it. Because God gave you the job, gave you that boss, and unless God removes that boss, it's God's will for you to do what that boss asks you to do as long as it doesn't go against the Bible. So you should do as unto Christ. We should love the Lord enough that with all of our decisions that we make with our soul to do it as if we were doing it unto Christ. But well, now we got the flesh and the spirit. Well, there are two different aspects. Okay, like light and dark. Can't have both at the same time. Right, well, the flesh can take control of your heart, mind, and soul if we allow it. Again, the soul is the decision maker. That's where all this is boiling down to is in our souls. Right, that's why our soul goes to heaven because the flesh, the mind, the heart, those things are temporal until he gives us a body like Christ and that one's going to last for forever God made the body and the soul and the heart and the mind and all that out of dust but he breathed into man the breath of life and then man became a living soul the soul's what came from God but your soul can lean under the flesh and there's a fleshly way to use your heart and to use your mind right when our emotions mean more to us than the morality of the action then we're going to do what we feel like doing regardless of the consequences doesn't matter how much we know it's wrong if we love that enough we'll do it that's why where a man's heart is that's where his treasure is also but likewise with the mind there is a fleshly way to consider things we've already kind of dealt with that right you can think about it carnally which means you're going to leave God out of it. Or you can consider things with God. The flesh might always say, yeah, but. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, but. You know, that, that math doesn't work out. You've only got X amount in the pocketbook, and you've got Y in bills, and that means that there's red in the ledger. There's no black. Right? But the spirit is the part of you that is acquainted with God. The carnal man does not know God because the carnal man is still sinful. It did not get saved. But your soul, when God breathed it into you, it also has a spirit. Right? That is what communes with God through the Holy Spirit. Your mind does not commune with God. Your heart does not commune with God. Your spirit communes with God. And based off of what you do with God, it'll make an impact on your heart and on your mind. If we don't fall to the carnal man. Right? Well, who chooses whether we use the fleshly side of our hearts, fleshly side of our mind, or whether we use our heart and our mind for the honor and glory of God? That's your soul. So there are the three parts of you, heart, mind, soul. Then there are the two different ways that you can exercise them. The carnal man can use those things or the spiritual man can use those things. But it all boils down to the soul as the decision maker. Okay? I know that, you know, I spent longer on that than I wanted to, but God said to do all that, so we did it. 
Hopefully y'all get any questions. We good? All right, now we can get into the verses we read. All right, verse number 12. It says, Bless is the man that endureth temptation, for when he has tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Well, James, here in verse number 12, Blessed is the man. I want to be blessed. Don't you want to be blessed? Amen. That endureth temptation. That means you're going to have to put up with it. Whether you endure it or whether you succumb to it, you're going to have to deal with temptation. But if you can endure it, if having done all to stand, you stand there for, and if you stand as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, if you endure that time of temptation, when you're tried, well, what is trying? That's seeing whether there's actually anything in it worth of value. Temptation is an opportunity, not from God. You know, God didn't send it, but God can turn it into an opportunity. We're going to get to that in two verses. But temptation is a, a chance for you in your soul to say, no, 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 I love God more than that. And I'm going to show that there's something in me valuable enough to choose to do something different than what the temptation is. Temptation is the world trying to say, ah, come on, you really, you really don't care about God all that much. Temptation is the flesh trying to say, ah, come on, we really don't need to do that. Wouldn't you rather come over here and do this? Every temptation you can boil it down to, is it God or is it this? Do I choose to do what my spirit tells me or what the flesh is trying to tell me? And you can be at war in yourself. You can have emotions in your heart that are pulling you in both directions. Your mind can tr be trying to say, well, hey, this makes sense over here. But then another part of you can be saying, well, hey, without faith it's impossible to please God. It doesn't make sense, but I know that God's got a plan. And those things can be going on simultaneously inside of you. Everybody in here knows what that is, what that feels like, because we've all dealt with it. But what is it? That is temptation. That is your body trying or weighing out what it is that it's going to do. Temptation doesn't affect the mind. Temptation doesn't affect, you know, the heart. Temptation is dealing with those contrary feelings, contrary thoughts, and in your soul deciding what to do. That's what temptation is. Temptation directly affects your soul. How many times do we find where people in the Bible who didn't know what to do, they were warring with themselves. It says that they were vexed in their soul because that temptation vexed them in their soul, not their heart or not their mind. You can be feeling awful. Your brain can be telling you there's no sense in going on, but in the in your soul, you can say, no, 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 we're going to keep walking after God. That is constraining or compelling the flesh to do that which it doesn't want to do. And there are other days that you could be living on cloud nine with God. All you're thinking about is God. Everything that you desire is God. And then something come out of left field, catch you completely off guard, and then now you're confronted with this and you don't know what to do. And everything that you've done, everything you planned on doing for God, as much as you love God, this just came straight up into view and you can't see anything else. That still is temptation. That still, you've got to decide whether to focus on this or to, even though it's big, even though it's right in front of you, keep your mind, keep your heart stayed upon the Lord. That choice comes down to the soul. Why do you think? It says, after we he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. We've already said wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. If you've put your heart, if, you've, if it's fixated on heaven, laying up things for the kingdom of heaven, if your mind is constantly aware of the fact that, hey, I'm going to have to stand before Jesus one day and give an account of all the deeds I did in my body after I got saved, then regardless of what comes up, your first reaction won't be, well, what does the flesh think? Your first reaction will be, Holy Spirit, help me so that I don't fall to this temptation. Because the flesh can only reach out to the flesh. The flesh isn't in contact with anybody else. The flesh is isolated. That's why it wants you to be isolated. But see, through the Spirit, I've got an anchor. I've got a companion. I've got a comforter. And his name is the Holy Spirit. 
In temptation, leaning to the flesh isolates me. Not just from God, but from everybody else. Because even sinners don't want to admit to other sinners that they're sinners. Why do you think that people... It, it could be 4 o'clock in the morning. Somebody could go into a store, downtown, wherever, and they're still going to get a brown paper bag for whatever they bought at the liquor store. There's nobody around to see it, but they're still ashamed of it. Don't want somebody else to see it. Because your sin isolates you, not just from Amen. God, but from others in the world. Right. Whether they're carnal or whether they're fleshly. At night, the sin that tears you up, it doesn't keep other people awake. It keeps you awake. It isolates you. But see, the spiritual side, after you get saved, that only draws you closer to God. Closer to other people. Hey, pray for me. Really don't you know, want to tell y'all what I'm dealing with because that's not important. Just pray for me that God would help me. Right? I don't need y'all to be bogged down with all of my business, but if you don't mind, just pray for me. And if they're hooked up in the Spirit, they'll bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's why those that overcome temptation, that endure and pass the trial, will receive the crown of life because they loved God more than what the flesh wanted to do. Than what the flesh reasoned was the best course then what the heart desired to do they still through the spirit chose God instead see when you chose Christ on the day that you got saved the devil's trying to give you as many opportunities to choose something other than Christ so that you embarrass yourself before God because he knows that he can't choose God because one day he said no I choose me and God kicked him out of heaven so he's trying to show God that you're not worthy of the grace. You're not worthy of the mercy. You're not worthy of the love. And God knows that, but he loved us anyway. That's why John 3.16 is so powerful. Because he loved us in spite of ourselves. But temptation is just another chance to choose God instead of the world. You're not choosing him for salvation, but you're choosing him by faith to take you through the rest of your life after you got saved. To lead you to heaven the way that he says is best. Or you can choose the world and reject God. That's what temptation is. That's why there's a great reward for those that overcome it because they love God. But then, verse number 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Well, if every man is tempted, that means everybody in here, that's us. That's everybody. And it doesn't just say save folks. Although he is writing this to save folk. He didn't say the saints. Every saint is tempted. No, no, every man's tempted. Lost people are tempted so that they stay in sin instead of finding a solution for their sin. Save folk are tempted to be away from God because the devil knows if we're hooked up with God, we can make an impact on the world. Because if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. Well, the world will know that we're his disciples because we have a love one for another because we love the one that's inside of them just be because he's inside of us too. That kindred spirit. Everyone's tempted because the devil knows the further he can get people away from God, then the less of a chance there is that they'll get saved. God can reach to the uttermost. Doesn't matter how far away they are. But the more he can keep them isolated and away from other people and away from the things of God the better chance it is that they're going to spend eternity with Him. The further away a saved person gets from God, the worse of an impact they're going to have on the world. And you can get so far away from God that you actually do damage to the cause of Christ. It's not just that you're not doing good, you're doing evil to the reputation of God to those around you. That's what the devil's ultimately striving for out of our lives. He's happy if we're on the sidelines, but he's even happier if we're out there hurting the team that we're supposedly helping. True. So every man's tempted. And why do we know that it's the devil? Because of verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. We should shout on that part. It's never even occurred to God that evil's an opportunity. 
He's so holy that anything that isn't holy, long before it gets to him, is consumed in his holiness. You know what that tells me? If I can get to him, whatever's tempting me is going to go away because he can't be tempted. If I can get up underneath of the wing of God, whatever's tempting me is going to disappear long before it gets to me when I'm right next to God. But not only can he not be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. And we've heard it preached. God wouldn't be holy if he said, be holy, and then tempted us to sin. Everything that God does is to equip us, make availability, and give us cause to live holy for God. He encourages, encourages us to do so. He takes upon himself the burdens that we cannot carry so that we can live holy for him. That's why Jesus said take his yoke upon him because his yoke is easy. His burden is light because he's bearing the load. He just asks us to every day choose to do as he would ask us to do. As he would have done if he were still here on earth. Why do you think that the Bible says that the Spirit leads and guides us into all truth? The Spirit won't lead you into temptation. It's not just talking about the Word of God and illuminating Spirit and truth and guide us through here. No, no, no. It's also talking about out there. The Holy Spirit will never, you know, yank back on the reins and say, hey, slow down there. You ought not go down there if what's down there is holy. He will never say, don't do that if that thing is holy. Because God cannot tempt us to sin. So when the Spirit says no, or when the Spirit says, hey, this way, it's for our betterment. He's leading us. He is guiding us when we, not knowing everything, not being all-powerful, not being able to be omnipresent, we don't know what's on the other side of the hill. But He does. So when someone said, well, I thought that's what God wanted me to do, well, God didn't show them to do it. They use their mind to, in themselves, in the carnal man, say, I would like to do that, and I think it's something God would be proud of. But if it's sin, if it ended up being for their harm, if it wasn't, you know, all truth, if it was temptation, that wasn't God, and God had nothing to do with them being led down there. God was nowhere in light being tempted by the cities of the plain and by Sodom and Gomorrah. But I saw it and said, I can make a living down there. And I believe originally he intended upon staying afar because the Bible says that those cities looked as the Garden of God. You know what that means? It looked like Garden of Eden. You can raise some sheep in the Garden of Eden. You can take care of some herds in a garden that's that luscious. But eventually the herds went, the servants went, and then he finds himself not just living in the plains, but living in the cities. Amen. God wasn't in any of that. Amen. But still the Bible says that Lot was a righteous. He lived righteous in a sinful city. But he loved the city so much that even his own daughters that had left his house didn't see value in living for God like their dad lived for God. Because their dad did as thus saith the Lord but he loved the things of the world a whole lot every day of Lot's life was temptation and he may not have committed sins or if he did he may have made the sacrifice for it but that love and that desire pulled him far enough away from him, pulled him far enough from God to where he didn't make impact on his children we're all apt to do that that's why he gave us the comforter. Jesus said that it was for our benefit that he went to heaven so that the comforter could come. Because although Christ living and dwelling among man was one, a miracle, two, amazing for those that were around him, everybody in the multitude did go back home in those multitudes. They had to be separated from Christ because Christ was going to a different place. And their place was there. That's what he told the madman of Gadara after he wasn't a madman anymore. He said, no, you can't come with me. You've got to stay here. You've got to witness to those people. Well, he did that without the Spirit. Christ is saying, if I go away 
through the Spirit, I'll be with you always. Everywhere you go, I'll be right there with you through the Spirit. After that day, the madman of Gadara, even though he couldn't get on the ship with Christ that one day, and then Christ came back and a whole lot of people believed on Christ because that fellow just went around telling them what Jesus did for however long of a period that was. One day he received the Spirit, and guess what? He said, you know what, Lord? I really wish I could have gotten on the ship with you, but I'm glad you're here with me every day now. Mary Magdalene went and looking for him down at the tomb, but one day she found out, hey, he's with me all the time. Doesn't matter if he's you know, on that side of the earth or whether he's in heaven, whether he's, whatever he's doing, he's with me. He could hear, her say, or hear him say, Mary, whenever she wanted to, because through the Spirit she could fellowship with him. The Spirit is there to help us navigate those temptations because God can't tempt us. But every man being tempted, we all have to confront it. So then, when we get down to verse number 15, well, let's back up to 14 for a second. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Well, drawn away from what? The Spirit. Because if we are communing with the Spirit of God, with our spirit, if we are praying without ceasing, if we're always in communication with God, maybe outwardly, definitely inwardly, whether we're focused on the task we're doing, always having that channel open, not letting iniquity come into our life, so that if the Spirit goes to tell us something, He can. If I need to make a request of God, He does hear it. That I haven't regarded iniquity in my heart to where He won't hear my prayer. When temptation comes my way, if all those conditions are checked, the Spirit will be able to say, hey, you know not to do that. But if that avenue is closed, or if I don't choose to walk in the Spirit, which is, if you go back, I don't know how long ago, but when we did our little series on why revival, why this generation hasn't seen revival, because they don't walk in the Spirit. If we're not walking in the Spirit, when temptation comes, there won't be any help from God. Because we have isolated ourselves from God. The Spirit will not because we don't give the Spirit an opportunity to. Because that soul still has free will. And if we choose not to listen to God, we won't listen to God. So, when we are drawn away from what? The Spirit, from God. Why are we drawn away? Because of our own lust, and because of that lust in the flesh, we are enticed. Okay, well, what is lust? Lust is just a desire to do something. You can lust after holy things, things of God. Right? You can lust after fellowship with God. You can lust after doing things of God. But most of the time, they use the word desire the things of God, love the things of God, cherish the things of God. Because lust always has a negative connotation. It is the desire to do what God wouldn't, you, wouldn't want you to do. That's why we see, you know, we can go and look at the times that the, the Satan tempted Christ after he had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. What was it? The lust of the eyes. Not the lust of the spirit to do the things of God. It was the lust of something fleshly. He tempted him to sin with the uh, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. Then the pride of life. Well, what is pride? The lust to do what I want to do and not what God wants me to do. It is lusting after the things of God or lusting against the things of God, but lust of the flesh, always sinful. If the Spirit gives you a desire to do, well, again, he leads and guides us in all truth. God cannot sin. God cannot tempt us to sin. If God puts something on your heart, it's always right to do that. But those things that come from the flesh, and if they take root in our heart and we become emotionally attached, if they take root in our mind and it makes sense to us to do that, that is what being enticed is. Enticed is not just having the desire to do it, but to also rationalize why we should do it to justify why it's okay for us to do it. We all have desires to do things every day. It doesn't mean that we do them. But to be enticed 
it's sort of like those carnival barkers. Right? They can put a stand up and it's like, ah, you know what, I might want to do that and then we forget about it because we start doing something else. But if you've got a guy there on the corner telling you all the good things that you can win, how you look like the person that's just strong enough to hit this thing hard enough to make it go all the way to the top and ding the bell. Right? But then, you know, you step back, you take that guy out of the equation, well, I don't know how heavy that mallet is. I don't know. I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can find out that, you know, they're stacking the odds against you. But, I mean, you get a guy strong enough, he'll be able to hit that thing hard enough to get it all the way to the top. But I know that I'm not that guy. But if he's telling me, yeah, you are. You know what? You can. A guy about your size did it earlier. But I get, that guy may swing a sledgehammer for, you know, every day of his life as a part of his career. That's not me. But being enticed is, here's all the reasons why it makes sense. Here's all the reasons that you desire to do it. Because, you know, the Bible says there's blessing and cursing. and everything. It may not be something sinful. It may just be something that's going to lead you away from God because you invest more time into that than you do God. I'm not going to... I like movies. Movies are fun. Movies are a way of escapism. Right? You're stressed. You may have seen that movie 900 times, but you just may put it on because you just need something to take your mind off. You may be feeling awful. Right? You may have just had a day that you're like, I just need to forget about the day. And you can use that to your advantage. Because if I'm sitting over there in the corner thinking about how angry I am at everybody because of everything that happened to me that day, I'm very liable to be angry but also to sin, which the Bible tells us not to do. Be angry and sin not. Well, how do I do that? Forget my anger. Escapism. Just get away to something different. Right? And I know the whole time I may be angry at them, but it's not their fault. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. I know it's not them. I know it's sin. And sometimes I just need to get away. Right? There's nothing. But, but when I become so obsessed, obsessed with movies that I've got to be a... a film nut where I've got to buy everything that comes out. If you tried to watch everything that comes out, you wouldn't sleep. You couldn't watch everything in your lifetime and I guarantee you most of it's going to be garbage. Very few good ones. That's why I wait for reviews to come out before I go see movies most of the time. Right? It's got to be really good and get a whole lot of buzz for me to you know sit down to it. If not, guess what I'm doing? Indiana Jones. Star Wars. Lego Batman. That's a really good movie. But what it, there's a difference between moderation and going all into something because it satisfies a fleshly urge. Because it satisfies that desire of the flesh to always be occupied. One of the hardest things for a Christian to do is stand still and wait on God. Because the flesh wants to do. In the Spirit, you can be zealous of good works for the Lord, but if you just go out and do something without God's sanction, you're going to do more harm than good. Because doing it outside of God's will is sin. Temptation is dealing with all of those emotions, all of those thoughts, all of the reasons that your flesh says, hey, that makes sense, or hey, that would make us feel good. Juggling that against the Spirit, well, hey, God didn't say to do it. We shouldn't do it. Or God said it's okay to do it, but don't get too invested into it. Right? If you like the Kentucky Wildcats so much that you're going to stay home and watch a game rather than come to church, that's not right. Okay? Doesn't matter what it is. Insert X where I said Kentucky Wildcats. If X is going to keep you from reading your Bible, from praying, if X is going to keep you when a brother does need help from bearing that brother's burden, you're not fulfilling the law of Christ. If X causes division in the church, it's not a God. If X is more important to you and you're willing to do harm to those around you in the church, those that God fitly framed you together with because He knew they were the ones that you would need to help bear your burdens in your time of need, it's not a God. And those temptations, they start with being enticed 
It's not a sin to feel the urge to do it. It's a sin to act on it. But enticing is the world and your mind and your heart making the best case possible, putting it in the biggest box with the biggest bow on it, trying to convince you to this best thing for you. That's enticing. And when you buy into the sales pitch, then we get to verse number 15, when lust hath conceived. What's that mean? All that enticing, all those desires, finally take root in your heart and result in an action. And you act upon it. When lust conceives in your body, in your flesh, and results in an act, then it bringeth forth sin. Your soul decides to buy into the sales pitch and do. And if it goes unrepentant, if you cling to it, it separates you from God. As long as it's present, as long as you have not asked God for your forgiveness, turn from it, which is what repent means, and purpose not to do it again, you have separated yourself from God. That is why the last part of the verse is true. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Because sin separated man from God in the garden, and when sin works out its final course, it results in the death of these bodies. We were cursed with sin from the moment we were conceived, and by the time sin is done, we'll just be dust in the ground again. But spiritually, sin does the same thing. Doesn't matter how strong your roots are, doesn't matter how long you've been saved, doesn't matter how long or how much you used to, if you stop and you insert sin, your spirituality starts dying. You have immediately been cut off from the thing that gave you life, which is the true vine, Christ himself. And when sin has its work, it will result in your spiritual death if it goes on un- What's the word I'm looking for? If we go on without dealing with it long enough, you'll be as spiritually dead as someone that's lost. You won't even know what the voice of God sounds like anymore in your life because you've cut yourself off from the Spirit that long. You'll be carried about with every wind of doctrine. You'll be carried about with any enticement from the world because you're looking to find what you used to have, but you can't even remember what it was. That's why verse number 16 is there. Do not err, my beloved brother. James is saying, I love you so much that God revealed this to me and I have the passion to write it down and deliver it unto you because the only reason we have this book of the Bible is because God showed James, hey, write that stuff down. And James said in his soul, I'm going to choose to write that stuff down and send it to the people that God said to send it to because I love them, because I love him. And because I want them to know if they err spiritually, they're going to start dying just like these bodies start dying. Your spirituality is the only thing in your life that doesn't have to grow old, that doesn't have to weaken, that doesn't have to give in to the test of time because it's not touched by sin unless we allow it to be. Because our spirituality is not between our flesh and God, it's between our soul and God. And He sealed our soul so that it will not know sin any longer while we're still here on the earth. So that connection between our soul through our spirit and his spirit can only get stronger if we continue to feed it. It'll never get any weaker. It'll never lose any of its luster. We can taste and still see that the Lord is just as good as he was the day that we first tasted. Where the body may not be able to do the things that it used to do, where the mind may not be as quick as it used to be, where some of those desires that we used to have in our heart have faded with the test of time, everything from God still stays the same because He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. James is saying don't err because you're going to lose the best thing in your life. He's saying don't fall to temptation. Endure it even though it's a trial, even though it's a test, even though it's going to be hard. Do it because that thing that is most precious to you, that's the best thing for you, if you do err, it's going to start dying. Not because God's changed, but because you've started constricting God in your life. And just like a water hose, if you shut the valve off, you don't have any more water in your life. If you stop going back to the well, you're going to get thirsty. 
James is saying, just set up shop next to the well. Live at the well. Don't err. But love God like God told us to love God through Christ. Love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love Him so much that every decision you understand, you're convinced, you're convicted of the fact that if I do something wrong, I'm going to bring honor and shame and disgust to God. Because God can't be disgusted with us even though He loves us and even though He saved us. He's told the church of Laodicea that He would spew them out of His mouth because they weren't cold nor hot. He's saying, you're no value to me. You may be saved, but He turned some over to the destruction of the flesh so that their soul will stop being torn to pieces every night. He doesn't want to see us live a life of misery, a life of torment, because our soul doesn't know what to do. He's saying, here's everything you need to do. Here's all the decisions that you're going to be faced with. Here's everything that you need to make the right decision so you don't err, so that our relationship doesn't have to get any weaker. So that it only gets stronger. Because whereas some things in the world, a movie can only be watched so many times, and I can quote it to you, but I don't enjoy it as much as I did the first time, and it blew my mind. You can watch it, I mean, you can try and look, you can get all the collector's editions and all the commentaries you want, it's still not going to be the same. And there may be nothing wrong with it, it may just be something that I enjoy doing, but every time I come to God, He's sweeter and sweeter every day. Doesn't matter how long it's been there, doesn't matter if it's something new or something old, it's going to be just as good. Because he's always good. And he's just as good today as he was yesterday. And he'll be just as good tomorrow if he blesses us with tomorrow as he was today. But the moment that I err, the moment that I choose something different, it's not him that's getting any less sweet. It's me that's not as sweet as I used to be on God. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.